Let me just uh, let me just start by saying thank you for still being here. I uh, I've thought about it, and I, I think it's very appropriate to end the conference talking about babies, because having had a couple of babies, I can tell you that they end all kinds of things, <laughs> like uh, sleep and having money and hearing. My kids just scream all the time, actually. But um, what I what I'm gonna focus on today is just two, two areas, and that's functional effects of xanthophils on, on development and, 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 and sort of <laughs> traditional roles like light filtering and antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. And, and then this other category, which I just call other, meaning not being light filters or, or antioxidants or anti-inflammatories. And one example being, you know, the the ornamentation, the, uh, the use of carotenoids in, in some animals and birds and fish and very clearly other. So I'm going to talk about some other ideas they may have and may, some other functions they may have in, in babies. And uh, the, the first to start off with is just the idea of, of you know, how light damages biological tissues. And, this is uh, extra uh, important for children just because they have a ton of light exposure and are especially uh, susceptible to damage due, due to light. And this was an, a, a study that came out of Australia, a very sunny place I hear. And in this study, they, they measured these little yellow spots here, these solar burns called pinguecula, which you can quantify with increased fluorescence of the, of the sclera. And in the study, they found that a good third of these children had clinically significant pinguecula. And, 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 and people report that they see these, these types of, of uh, indications of light damage in, in kids all the time. And indeed, if you just think about the kind of, of actinic exposures that kids have, they're, they're very many. For example, the, uh, the sunglass industry, especially making sunglasses for children, is is very unregulated. So when they've done measures of, of uh, sunglasses that, that kids wear, they tend to transmit a lot of ultraviolet light. And of course, they darken the visual field. So they simultaneously increase the size of their pupil and transmit ultraviolet light. So they're actually causing more uh, damage to their retina than if they didn't wear these kind of sunglasses at all. Or they use... Uh, blue light to uh, cure dental compound when, when they put in uh, fillings and, and teeth. That's why they put these little orange filters on them to protect the eye of the, of the dentist from those kind of exposures. Or babies are often jaundiced, so they'll use blue light therapy to break up the, the bilirubin in, in, in their skin. Sometimes, in fact, they even mistakenly think they're jaundiced when they have keratinemia. Babies often have keratinemia from eating pureed carrots and spinach and things. You can always tell the difference, by the way, because when they're jaundiced, they don't have a yellow sclera, or excuse me, they have a yellow sclera. That doesn't happen with keratinemia. I don't know if, if a lot of you, some of you aren't old enough to remember black light posters, but that was very cool when I was a kid, <laughs> having a black light poster. But uh, you put, they're always kind of psychedelic looking like this, by the way. It's my generation. But um, if you look at the, the lights used with black light posters, they're ultraviolet emitting lights. So you can still go to uh, hardware stores and buy black lights with, for black light posters, which are making a big comeback. And you know their spectrum is, is just ultraviolet light. So we get a lot of exposure. Even a lot of fluorescent lights now emit ultraviolet light. So we get a lot of exposure to, to damaging light. And just to remind you that light is damaging, I guess I don't really mean to remind this crowd, but this is a, just a nice case study within subject uh, sample, I think. And this man was a uh, truck driver for 69 years. And this was the side of his face that was turned toward the, the interior of the cab. This was the side of his face that was turned toward the window. You can just see the dramatic difference in, 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 in light damage to his skin. In fact, this is his bisected face with the cab side. And this is the side from the window. And you can even see the underlying physical changes to his, the structure of his skin. So light, is, light can be quite, quite, quite damaging. We know that, that the carotenoids, particularly lutein and zeaxanthin, are protective to skin. So uh, this was an example of a study that was done with, with elderly women where they 
supplemented 12 milligrams of lutein and zeaxanthin for, for 12 weeks. And what they found compared to placebo was a, a dramatic increase in skin lipids, a dramatic reduction in peroxidation products in the skin, a very a large increase in a hydration, and a, and a significant improvement in elasticity, almost 20% for that period of time. So that was a pretty dramatic effect on, on, on the health of, of their skin. We also know that carotenoids go into skin, hence babies becoming keratinemic, um, very early on. And of course, one, one, one problem with a lot of the formulas that don't have lutein and zeaxanthin in them is all their stores that they received in utero just start going down as soon as they're born. This, these are data from uh, Paul's lab and, and measuring uh, uh, using Ramon spectroscopy, the carotenoid levels in skin. And you can see in breastfed babies, it stays pretty high. But in formula-fed babies after birth, it just starts declining when they, when they don't get it from the formula. Um, now, another reason that, that, that light damage is so significant for infants is they're, they're, they have a number of, of increased susceptibilities. In fact, if you look at lipofusin increase, it's, it's dramatically more rapid in the first 10 years of life than any other time. Um, and they, they have this increased uh, transmission of ultraviolet light uh, by their crystalline lens that doesn't close up until sometime in the teen years. In fact, my, uh, one of my graduate students, Laura Fletcher, her dissertation now is on ultraviolet vision in babies. We're measuring their ability to see ultraviolet light. And one of, the, one of our first challenges was that all the, the uh, the, the light emitting diodes that we use that, that, that are supposed to just emit ultraviolet light, a lot of the students could see them, which made us suspect that they weren't just emitting ultraviolet light. So we, we went to great lengths trying to measure and be sure that there was absolutely no visible light coming from these diodes, and there was not. It was just the fact that some students can still see uh, ultraviolet light. In the early days when they would do cataract surgeries and put in IOLs, they didn't have uh, uh, UV-absorbing chromophores. So even older people would see ultraviolet light. Remember, William Stark used to come to a lot of these meetings, and he'd always talk about how dazzling it was to see people out on the beach at Arvo, because they, the sunlight reflects all that ultraviolet light, and, and uh, he would be able to see that. So, so now we know, of course, that, that lutein and zeaxanthin absorb mostly in the visible blue, but it does extend down into the ultraviolet, and that's especially true in its, in its aggregated form. Um, now, it's not just down into the ultraviolet that affects carotenoids, especially circulating carotenoids, but even, even as far down as, as, as ionizing radiation, like x-rays. So for instance, this was a study that was just published out of Hawaii, where they uh, took children who'd, who'd had medical diagnostic scans. And you know, in, the, in the world of cancer, by the way, they, they have attributed you know, at least 2 or 3% of all total cancers are, are due to medical diagnostic scans and low dose. You know, we're talking close to dental uh, uh, x-rays here. And um, what they found in this study when they measured both cellular indica indicators of cellular damage before the scan and all these circulating uh, food components, like lipid-soluble uh, antioxidants, for instance, was there was fairly uh, significant reduction uh, due to the scan. So the, the lutein, zeaxanthin, cryptoxanthin, lycanine, all these carotenoids were, were reduced by uh, exposure to the skin. And a lot of their indicators of cellular damage went, went high up. So uh, th these are exposures. Now, the other sort of traditional role of, of uh, the xanthophils are, the, are that they're antioxidants. And we have good empirical evidence that they serve this function in infants as well. So I'm not going to go through all this data, but just here's an example where they'll, they supplemented lutein and, and placebo and, and looked at uh, oxidative products like hydroperoxides and biological antioxidant potential. And, and lutein caused a significant increase. And there's a lot of data to this effect that they serve this antioxidant function. And again, uh, a thing that's especially important for infants, because they seem to be under higher oxidative stress than adults. One example that was mentioned by Martha the other day is that they just have very poor oxygen uh, regulation in the retina. 
In fact, they, they, especially from the choroid side, they, they don't autoregulate well. And, and in fact, one of the very early uh, theories of what xanthophils were doing in the retina, you know, it's always been conspicuous that they're in that hypoxic region right around the, the foveal avascular zone. And there's very recent data showing that the distribution of lutein and zeaxanthin, it correlates very highly with the foveal avascular zone. And uh, but the idea was that they aid in oxygen metabolism. They do that in some species, like deep sea fish have very carotenoid rich, rich brains because it, it aids in oxygen metabolism. But be that as it may, just children have a lot of uh, oxygen stress. One reason, of course, is because they're building a nervous system. If you uh, take a slice of visual cortex in a newborn, and then just six months later, you can see this, this very rapid proliferation of cells. One reason why we uh, encourage mothers to have DHA, for instance, so early on, is because they're, they're building these, uh, these cells. And of course, they're not built out of air. They're built out of the components of their diet. And DHA is a, is a big fatty acid in, in the brain. And in fact, the brain, like the retina, where photoreceptors are about, can be as high as 50% DHA, is uh, the, the retina takes up DHA, or the frontal cortex takes up uh, DHA very rapidly as opposed to other fatty acids. And you know, DHA is a, is a great fat for the nervous system. It's a very, it's a very fluid fat. Uh, so you know, in neurons, obviously, you want information exchange in, in and out of the cell. But it's also, of course, the most oxidizable fat. So you have uh, this really oxid, you know, brain with a lot of oxidizable fat. It needs some way of dealing with that. Um, one way, obviously, is it concentrates just a whole host of lipid-soluble uh, antioxidants, the xanthophils being in that, in that category. And, and they're detectable very early. So uh, about the eighth, 10th week of prenatal development, you, you start seeing them. Just as the ocular tissues begin to form, they start to intercalculate within the tissues. And these are, these are the early data from John and, and, and Richard just showing that they're, they're very present uh, right away, right in the retina, as soon as when they measure them. Now, these are more uh, recent data, again from, from Paul's lab, using uh, uh, reflectance to measure lutein and zeaxanthin in the retina. And what they found is they had found slightly lower levels in infants and, and children compared to adults, but particularly low levels in, in preterm infants. In fact, in this study, if I'm, if I'm saying correctly, they couldn't detect any at all in the 40 or so that they, that they measured. And, and one reason that they speculated that that might be so is preterm babies are even under higher oxidative stress. They're often born in respiratory distress, so they stick them in oxygenated incubators. And in fact, one of the, the greatest advances, I think, in, in the treatment of retinopathy of prematurity was that they started titrating the oxygen in, in these incubators more correctly. And that dramatically lowered incidence very rapidly. But be that as it may, still oxygen, that, that, that increased exposure to oxygen just causes a, a host of, of negative side effects. So it was, it, was, it was thought very early on, how do we deal with that problem? And, and it's, it's, it's complicated, because especially uh, preterm babies have a very delicate balance between using pro-oxidants and, and, and damage due to oxygen. So you know, that, that was the complication of the vitamin E story. They used vitamin E with these preterms, and it didn't turn out as well as they thought it would. You know, it's very rich in rods, so thought, well, that's a good choice. But it, it, it had negative effects on their immune function, et cetera. It didn't turn out as well as they, as they thought it would. Um, not just in their retina. These are data now from, from Liz's group. But in their brain, preterm babies have less uh, xanthophils throughout. So they, they, uh, they seem to be a, a real deficient group. Given that was true, there have been at least a few studies looking at supplementing preterm infants and, and measuring, uh, measuring outcomes. This is one early example from Lou Rubin in, in Florida. And what they did is they took preterm infants and they, they gave them a control formula and then a supplemented formula that was supplemented with, with carotenoids. And they found that the babies, when, when compared to each other, the control formula babies had a reduced alpha wave in their ERG. And that's a, a measure of electrical activity of the rods, mostly. 
and, uh, and just indicates premature rod. So that was, uh, that was a significant outcome. They also measured inflammatory products in these babies. And the babies that were, were on human milk and on supplemented formula had significantly lower uh, C-reactive protein than, than babies that were on the, the control formula. And right at discharge, so that's a real critical period. So that was a real significant outcome. Now, one thing about looking at lutein and zeaxanthin studies in retinopathy and prematurity, and by the way, Unlike Matt and, and, uh, and John, I came up with a strategy for dealing with my 25-minute time limit. I'm pretty sure my sock will fit right over this thing, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> yeah. So if there's any problem. Anyway, so there's a retinopathy of prematurity. So, so one thing about doing these studies, this is, this is a very recent study that was done on retinopathy of prematurity. And, uh, here, here, here's, here's, and it was large, you know, as, as, as preterm babies go, you know, a study with a couple hundred preterm babies is very significant. But what they found was, <clears throat> so they supplemented them, by the way, about 0.14 milligrams for a month, month to six weeks. And I should point out, by the way, that's, for adults, that, that's analogous to maybe six milligrams a day. And remember, though, that supplement, supplemented formula is not nearly as bioavailable as human milk, so that's really not a lot for not a long time. But despite that fact, they found fairly significant reductions in, uh, in threshold retinopathy and prematurity, uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, 73% reduction in necrotizing enterocolitis. These are all very common uh, negative outcomes for, for preterm babies. And, a, and about a third reduction in the progression from stage one to stage two uh, ROP. So these are very, very significant results, and none of them were statistically significant. And uh, so one wonders, man, how much bigger of an effect do you have to have to get these things to be statistically significant? And it's, it's just these are fragile populations, and very variable. So it's a <coughs> studying, this is the state of the, the science right now, but studying preterm babies is very, very challenging. Okay. <coughs> Now, I want to move on to other. And, and, and please forgive me if I'm kind of speculative in this area, but, but what other kinds of things could lutein and zeaxanthin do during development? I wanted to say things that people had not yet spoken about, so this was my guess. And one, one idea is that they could actually influence the, 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 the later sort of uh, development. And of course, in lots of ways, one, one thing that has, I think is really emerging in, in uh, the science of development these days is that things that happen uh, during prenatal development and early in development have sort of cascading effects throughout life. One example is, is certainly epigenetic, but in just all kinds of categories, things that happen during the preterm years and term years seem to be ex extraordinarily important later in life. So there's a whole area of medicine now, fetal origins of disease, fetal programming that, that studies that these compounded effects, that what happens in, uh, pre -term, to preterm babies matters very much later in life. Um, here's just one example of, of, a, of a study. This is astaxanthin now, looking at its effects on, on stem cell potency and, and the, the, the later uh, differentiation of neural progenitor cells, showing that it indeed had effect. There's a, a similar study that was led by Matt, I think, um, <clears throat> looking at the differentiation of uh, stem cells into early progenitor cells via lutein. And, and what was interesting in both of these cases is that the xanthophils appear to do this, but the carotenes do, don't seem to do this. So you can add lutein to, to this kind of cell culture. It influences uh, the expression of these proteins like SOX and PAX that, that, la that, that lead to later differentiation of, of, of neural and, and glial cells. But things like lycopene don't seem to have that uh, effect. So that's suggestive of, a, of an influence on, on stem cells and, and DNA. And, and, uh, and of course, you know that we, we, you know, adults still have stem cells. When you look at, for example, stem cells in the, in the hippocampus, one of the surprising things is that adults have about as many as infants do. They're just dormant. So there's a big uh, area of study of how do you reactivate or stimulate all these dormant stem cells 
in the elderly brain. And there's been a few things that have been studied. Exercise seems to do it via brain-derived neural growth factors. Um, epilepsy, uh, seizures tend to work. <laughs> That's one it's harder to do. Um, caloric restriction, those, all these have been shown to stimulate uh, stem cell production in, in older brains. Or, or activities that, 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 that people no longer do. So for example, if you take you guys, not that any of you are elderly, but if you were, if you, if you, if you, if you go do uh, Sudoku or any of those things, that's not going to help you a lot. But if you, if you try to take up a skill that you don't have, if you only speak English, you need to try to learn to speak another language, then there seems to be benefits. This is a, a study that was just completed by Anna. She's in our lab, where she, we took older people, and we, we had a listening group and a group that we trained to play the piano over a, over a certain period. Then we measured their, their EEG and looked at this component of the EEG called mismatch negativity. And so what we did is we, we, we gave them a series of notes, and then you make a deviant note, and then you measure the, 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 rea the, the reaction of their brain to this deviant note. And basically, you get this very strong negative deflection in the group that we trained to play the piano but not in the group that, that were just listening, the control group. So that's a change in brain function that occurs uh, by, by training them to play the piano. And what, what, what was interesting about that is that you get that, but you also get improvements in cognition. So, uh, and, and that's been shown in, in other uh, areas of, uh, of study. So, so you can still change things. One of the other hot area now that we're all aging, you know, the aging trend of the population, we're all very, very concerned to how we can stay sort of 25 forever. And uh, one, one, so one, so drug companies are rapidly scrambling, trying to figure out how to, whoops, how to affect telomere uh, changes, for example. Telomere length is a real indicator of, of longevity. And, and of, of the many uh, nutrients that have been looked at, lutein and zeaxanthin is one, and, and, and they, they, they are, have been shown to be effective. Just the same with uh, vitamin C is another one that has been shown to, to do this. Um, I'm not going to go into this data, but we have other models of this. You can look at fruit fly models and add lutein, and it affects their, 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 their longevity. Cutler did a thing where he uh, measured bane concentrations of carotenoids, and across many species. I just have, have the primates listed here and uh, showed that that was related, that predicted longevity very, very highly. Now, uh, another effect that we've been talking a lot about here is cognition. And there's only been one study of, of relating lutein to cognition. And this was the study that was done by Sheila Innes's group. And, and basically, they concluded that lutein had no, lutein as measured by plasma and diet had no effect on cognition. Now, one complication, though, and I'm using this study as an example of the challenges here, was that, first of all, if you looked at how diet predicted plasma lutein, the, the correlations here are about 0.2 to 0.3. So that means that dietary lutein in this study explains about 10% of the variance in serum lutein. So it's not a great predictor of that. In fact, if you measure lutein on one day in children and then measure it on another day, about the best correlations I've ever seen are about 0.6. So in, in kids. So that means that serum lutein is not a wonderful predictor of serum lutein. So thinking that it might actually predict something complex like cognition seems, uh, seems a bit of a stretch. And in fact, if you look at dietary intake of, of lutein in kids, which is really low, by the way, their sample was about five or six times higher. And these kids all, all bought, by the way, were, were, were scoring about at the 90th percentile. So, so in other words, in this study, they expected that, that, that lutein would be related when these kids were already topped out this way. So there's ceiling effects in, in statistics that, that we have to consider. If you do more sensitive measures, like this is a study where they looked at EEG in babies. And babies actually have thin little bone. It's not even bone. It's, it, it's cartilage the first year. And uh, it, it's, uh, in fact, if you can push on their little fontanelle, that's always fun. Mothers love that. And uh, which can get really good EEG measures of babies' brains, and, and that that's, tends to be related to, uh, to lutein. Here's a, here's a study that we're doing with the, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, 
just me measuring macular pigment optical density, and in this case, relational memory by errors, and kids with higher macular pigment optical density have lower errors on this relational memory task. And, and by the way, I should point out that we're never going to see correlations much better this than this in the cognitive world, because it would be shocking if we did. You know, when I was a, a medical student, I think I had almost no macular pigment at all. And, uh, but I could still think. That's one reason why I didn't continue on being a medical doctor. But um, that was kind of a joke to you, medical doctor. But, uh, but, that, but anyway, that, you know, we, if, if it explained more variance than that, goodness gracious, that would, be, that would be stunning. Now, I just want to end my talk. That's actually green. You can't see it. But, but uh, by just saying one little word about obesity. Apparently, America is leading the world now in morbid obesity. And, we have a lot of fat in our body compared to itty-bitty retina, so there's obviously some competition, and, and there's been a number of studies from us and others showing that, that macular pigment is way lower when there's a lot of uh, fat in the body. And, and um, of course, fat has these, these vast metabolic effects. If you take an x-ray of, of, of two age-matched women, one normal-sized and one very overweight, you can just see the massive, this is why they call it the metabolic syndrome. It just affects everything, like lung capacity. Look at, the, look at the change in their nominate bones. So very, very ubiquitous effects on, on, on biology. And of course, babies are getting really heavy now. There's a sort of epidemic of macrosomia, these big babies and, and kids. When I was a kid, there was Paul Harper was like the fat kid in school. And, uh, but there was a fat kid in school. Now there isn't. I mean, they're just that, 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 that. It's like four eyes. I remember Carl had four eyes. But all kids are myopic and, and heavy now. So it's, a, it, it's becoming a, an issue on that side as well. And I think I'll, I'll end there and acknowledge my collaborators. Thank you very much for your attention. Your sock was a little broken. <laughs> we can see through. Questions? Everyone is exhausted. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have a question. <laughs> but if anybody else does, I'd happily give them the mic. Um, does anybody have a question? I, I do have a question. Yeah, there you go. I was curious about the, um, the cell differentiation and lutein or zeaxanthin's role in that. So could you maybe speak more to that? So is it, um, did it, does it actually... At using different mechanisms, differentiate those different cells, like you showed uh, astrocytes and oligodendrocytes and things like that. Could you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, you know, I, honestly, I think Matt might be the best person to speak to that since he did that. He was directly involved with that study. Can, can I make a suggestion? And sorry to try and end this rapidly, but my wife came in and said, lunch is ready for everybody. Could we, <laughs> could we take that question maybe in? I, I'm really keen that we do have a kind of a sum up session directly after lunch. I understand people are going to try and catch trains, planes and automobiles, but if we could go and have a nice barbecue lunch and then maybe come in and sum up, would that be okay, Randy? Sounds and we great. Can deal with that question. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs>